Carla, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. This is great. I thought nobody was going to come. So, for all of the how to get away with uh, murder fans or uh, murder heads, I think is what we call them. Um, I have, do, do they have a nickname? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess murder heads would be the best one. Uh, Annalise heads? I don't uh, know. Keating sure. 5, K5. Oh, K5, got it. K5. Um, that sounds like And a... then just Laurel fans all the way. <laughs> um, that clip was from uh, just before the mid-season break, right? This one's the one that just came back, so episode oh, okay. 10. Yes. Yes. And this is where we see you take the rap for Wes. <sighs> for Wes. I take the blame. How many times you got to do that for that guy? I don't know. I don't know. You know? And they're just like, oh, you just care so much about him. I'm like, Why? Why do I care so much? So then I have to make up ideas in my head as to why she cares. Um, and you will see. No, it, the relationship is like they're siblings, I feel. It's kind of like um, they're a brother and sister, and I just I have a brother, so it was very easy to me to just um, kind of substitute and He's that. kind of the more complicated one. I mean, you're sort of always in the situation where you have to take care of the messed up one. You're kind of the sort of uh, maternal, parental yeah. person for him, Which outside is, of Annalise. Yeah, I'm the opposite in, in my life, and I feel like Laurel's always a step ahead, and she's always planning it, planning it out for everyone, and whenever she sees that someone's about to break, or, you know, Michaela, and she took her ring in the first season, she's the one that had the engagement ring all along, and I'm just like, she's dark. This character's, you know, she's always... Um, She's just that step ahead, and she's kind of like a chess player. I believe that she's wanting everyone to be okay. and, and um, Well, the show itself is kind of like a chess game consistently. Yeah. Each character is its own sort of... They would all like to believe that they're the queen or the knight, but they're all kind of pawns in Annalise's uh, game. I'm Yeah, I'm still in denial about that. Oh, yeah? You think that you might be the... I think I manipulate her. I think it's the other way around. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're going to be proven wrong come season finale, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't know. We'll see. No, we, we laugh at how, um, you know, they always want us to have a very um, sort of teacher-student relationship with her, and we've kind of objected um, as to why that's the case, because, you know, she's sometimes very difficult. So we've had this season times where we can sort of stand up to her, and I feel like Laurel these next few episodes get to do, gets to do that, so. Do you think Annalise has become uh, sort of begrudgingly more respectful of Laurel because Laurel stands up to her? Yeah, I think that um, the episode where she says, uh, you know, I feel like I don't need to take care of you and that's why I don't talk to you, that's why I don't worry about you because you already take care of yourself. Um, and that's when Laurel sort of realizes, oh, actually, you know, she, um, she respects me more than I thought. And then she asks Laurel to be her new Bonnie. And then now she, in this episode, she asks Laurel to take care of Wes. And so she's giving her a lot of responsibilities. And I feel like Laurel isn't as dumbfounded by, by her um, as the others are. Let's backtrack for a minute because this show is so cool. It's, so, it's such a different vibe stylistically than most of the shows on television, be they at 8, 9, or 10 o'clock. Now, when you got involved with this, I'm sure you had to know that you were getting involved with the Shonda Rhimes show immediately. That sort of crowns it hit maker uh, right off the top. But were, did you know how, how the show was going to look and what it was going to sound like before you saw the pilot? I mean, the sort of techno soundtrack, the, the, the look of the show, the, even just the drawing of the, the, the uh, how to get away with murder at the top of the show was so cool and, and, and new. What did you think when you first saw it? Yeah, I thought um, we didn't know any of this. Um, I didn't know any of this. I wasn't living in L.A. when I came out to a uh, pilot that came out. I feel like I'm still in L.A. Um, I went out to pilot season, my first pilot season, and I booked the show. Where were you living? In Mexico City. Right. I was doing film in Mexico City, and, um, and I wanted to, you know, try it out. So I, I went there, and into my second week of pilot season, I got a few auditions as Michaela, as Laurel, as Rebecca, and then I finally tested for all of them, I think, or only Laurel and Rebecca. And then I got offered Laurel, and we did the pilot. So I thought, a lot of my friends do pilots, and then they never, nothing ever happens. Um, but How often do you hear that story of doing pilots and nothing ever happens? All the time, all the time. So I was kind of like, I get to be in a month for a month in Philly, have fun with these people, but I'm not going to see you guys again. So we were just kind of like... You shoot in Philly? 
We've shot in Philly. And did you shot the pilot in Philly, but the rest is shot but the in... rest in L.A. So in okay. Philly, in the first episode, when we're cold, we're actually freezing. And then we shot the woods back in L.A., and we are sweating, and we can't, like... Obviously, no smoke is coming out of our, you know, no vapors coming out of the mouth or whatever. But um, I have to say, what a uh, what a bummer to be like living in Mexico City, be called to do a pilot for a show, and like, yeah, but we're doing it in in Philly, so you're not going to be getting a real pilot season experience <laughs> in LA. You're going to be yeah, shooting they, this they, I know, I know, and and um, but I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to move to Philly. But then, thanks to I think Viola and having her family in LA, we get to shoot in LA, which is a blessing because a lot of shows don't don't get to shoot in LA, and um. And so, uh, what was the question? Uh, the question was what the show looked like after. Oh, after so we had no it. idea, and I don't think Pete had any idea. I think they waited until they saw the episode. But I remember thinking this looks a lot like uh, Dead Poet Society. I felt because of the whole the bridge and us running under the bridge and and us meeting in the woods. And anyway, that was my story. Um, <laughs> and were then, you on set? Were you on set going up to producers? So, so this is like Dead Poets Society, That's what Society, I kept saying, right? and they're it's like, uh-huh, like... sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you make, you know, you know, you have these ideas in your head, and then we went to see the pilot for the first time, and the music, as you said, plays such a strong part of the show, and the fast pacedness of it, um, and uh, just the editing of it. Like, we would spend hours on a scene that then on screen is just a second. Well, there's so many uh, montages within each episode, right? And the show, at this point, I feel like is very well known for having a montage at a certain point in the show. The gang, the Keating gang, essentially has to come up with what... Uh, you mean the sex montages, or which one? Well, there's the sex montages, but there's also... All the time, right. There's many... We're going to get to the sex montages. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Is there a whole section of the sex <laughs> I just have <laughs> waiting for it. I'm just like, There's oh. someone in my ear that's like, minute 10, sex montage, please. <laughs> uh, people are getting bored. Get to the sex, Ricky. Get to the sex. Uh, no, the montages of just kind of like uh, each episode uh, has its own case many times. And so you have like what the gang has to do to sort of figure out how to get to a certain place in that case. And it turns into a montage. I feel like there's two in each show. The first the first 30 minutes has its montage and the second 30 minutes has its montage. Yeah. When you guys are shooting the episode, are you told like, okay, this is the montage. This no, but we know now. We're really? like, this is the montage part. So then we just slack off a little bit. Oh, it, <laughs> <laughs> how do you know it's a montage part? Just because it's a little off, you know, it's like there's these terms on the, on the episode that's like swoosh. Right. The Kidding Five are working. Swoosh. We see Annalise walking toward a car. Swoosh. So we're just like, oh, more papers, 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 papers. And Laurel oh. walks into room. I got it. Yeah. End of scene. I got it. Yeah. End of scene. So you just know that it's like that tiny little bit will be used. And now as an actor, you can sort of manipulate a little bit if you don't want to cut them. Because they, because of time as well, the episodes are so long and... Um, they're going to end up cutting it. So instead of just having a pause in between, uh, you know, a couple of lines, you have to pause in between the sentence. If not, they're just going to cut, you know, they're just going to cut the silence. I don't know. It's little ways as an actor that you can play with, uh, you know, the editor so that they can't cut you. <laughs> that's what They the can't point. edit that you out. The five, that's what the five of the... <laughs> <laughs> the supporting cast does on set. Like, like, just, let's see who's going to not. Your line, just do not pause. Get in there. You are not going to get cut out of this yeah. episode. I promise. We know that all the looks of like OMG is going to be Michaela because she's really good at just going like, <gasps> and she's really good at those. So we're like, I'm not. My face isn't going to be taken at this. What's, at this what's, point. what's your montage part? Like my montage part is always just looking at like you know I don't believe this person. So I feel like they always take me for that part for when they need to show that, or like uh, oh I'm worried about Wes that. Yeah. You kind of feel like, oh, Wes. Wes. If, oh. if someone did a little um, montage of the times that Laurel says, Wes, 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 they make us repeat our names all the time. And I know it's TV, but we find it uh, quite annoying. Um, Let's get those K5 fans on it. Right? Yeah. Uh, so now, I've, yeah, 10 minutes. Sex montage. Sex. Um, <sighs> I told you. Uh, the show does feature a fair amount of, of sex. Uh, how much did you know going into that? Were you worried about doing that? Had you done uh, like sex scenes before? I'd done a lot of sex scenes before. So <laughs> I'm like, oh, you don't want to see my nipple? What are you talking about? Like, oh, okay, that's fine. It's like, oh, no, this is network TV. I don't know what that means. What does this mean? But it's as close as you could possibly get for network TV. See, I don't know. I don't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that you can't see this side of the boob and you can't see... Uh, you know, you can't see any of this, like the nipple. Sorry, I don't know if I can say that. Um, you can say then, it. 
You can't see, you know, obviously you can't see a butt, right? Um, but really? I... Huh? It's after 10 o'clock. I feel like you can see it. NYPD Blue used to show butts on ABC after 10 o'clock all the know. time. I don't know. They haven't I let mean, us I that's yet. all NYPD Blue Why was. hasn't Frank's butt been butts. on the on, on the screen then? I'm just saying. You know? I'm just saying. Um, More no, butts. we had So we had a cellar scene. Did you guys watch the, cellar, the scene in the cellar? There's the part where Laurel um, takes Frank to the cellar to get de-stressed. And so, um, and we take everything off. That was the time where I was literally almost butt naked in the scene of it, the, the showing of it. But then the way they edit it, it doesn't, you know, you can't see anything anyway. So I always feel protected by that. I'm like, someone in the editing room is going to be watching. Like, but like that's the, it. The whole crew ha can see it and you're like, fine, whatever. And the whole crew too, which is kind of there. embarrassing because they're like family now. So, yeah. And then, then they see me in crafty eating and they're like, Carla... <laughs> Carla. You know you got that nude scene. You know you got that or... nude scene. You remember that little pudgy bit where you were like, you know, leaning against the shelf? Yeah. Don't eat that piece of, you know. Donut or whatever. Yes, or what? yeah, yeah, brownie. That's the whoever said brownie <laughs> out there. Uh, now the show has been credited, and I think I think rightly so. I mean, uh, you're from Mexico City. The show itself is like the cast itself is pretty diverse. Uh especially with Viola Davis leading the cast, being the central character. And then at the same time, uh, there is lot, there, there are gay characters in the show as well who have sex scenes just as much and just as graphically more, as yeah. the straight characters. Um, was this something that they talked to you about going into it, that this is a show that no. was going to be pushed this way and we were thinking about it that I way? I love how you think they talk to us about things. Um, they, just, they essentially, you sign a check, you sign I a I just signed my life away up. for seven years. I, I had to, you know, I was like, oh, seven years. They're joking, and I just signed my name. Um, really, you signed for seven years? So I if, like, the show doesn't get canceled, you're on for seven years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're going to watch me age. Um... And, uh, yeah, we, we didn't know, but we had an idea because Shonda tends to, you know, graze and private and scandal always has been. She's, you know, she's very big on just representing the world the way it is behind and in front of the camera. Um, and the second they found out that I was Mexican, um, they asked me if I wanted to uh, turn Laurel. Her name was Laurel Wilding and then became Laurel Castillo. They're like, do you want her to be a Latina? And I said, yes with one condition, please, this they did ask me, um, was that she wasn't just the Latina. Because that's like somehow a characteristic that to me has never been part of my, you know, who I am. Like, you know, so well, either sexualized get, or just like the Latina, spicy Latina character. Yeah, you get a bunch of, you don't know who the, what the writing staff's going to be at that point. They're going to cast you as the Latina. Suddenly there's like a bunch of white dude writers in a room exactly. who are writing the Latina. The Latina and it's like, with Tijuana and tamales. Yeah. And so I said, you know, let's not show them that, that uh, let's just have her as, you know, a uh, human being. And then later, later on you can find out um, that she's, you know, from Mexico and I can bust in some Spanish and they let me do that. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, that's how that happened. But it must be, it must feel pretty good. I mean, especially when they're in the midst, when we're in the midst of conversations about Oscars so white and about television lacking diversity at times. I mean, television is sort of, uh, in relation to the movies, television is pushing forward a much more diverse standard. And yes. you're kind of a part of a show that I think was sort of ushering that in before anybody else. Yeah, that's what I feel, you know, Shonda's sort of changed the face of TV and to be on a show that um, is a part of that is great. And I feel that the more people see that it works and to tell you the truth, it's all about making money for studios. And so if they see that a show as diverse as, uh, as ours makes the same or if not more money or has the same rate more, as a, more um, then they're going to start catching on and wanting to do those things. They, they just think in money, literally. So... Um, so it's, it's one thing that people forget that like studios aren't necessarily they don't like, they they're that blind it's just money that's all they see that's all they they care about. Yeah. Uh, what's it like working with Shonda? How often is she around the set? Do you ever get to really work with her at all? She's she was first season she was there a lot more because I know it was Pete's first show Pete Nox 
his first show. Um, and she was there at every table read, and it was terrifying. Um, really? Is she terrifying? No, she's not terrifying. I'm just very insecure. It's a very big difference. Oh, um, ter- around bosses? Like, I can't. I just I can't. can't. Yeah. If you're my boss, I'm probably not well, going to in the eye. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't pay attention to me because I don't want to get fired. Bye yes, bye. exactly. Yeah. Um, and you just always want to say the right thing, but you end up saying the worst thing. Um, like, I'll tell you, all. okay, embarrassing. First time we're here in New York, TCAs or something. We're staying in a hotel. You know, Shonda, everyone, all the Shonda shows are here. I'm in my hotel room, and I, of course, selfie a picture of, like, Oh, thank you so much for, like, letting me stay at this hotel. Then had a nap, woke up 15 minutes later with, like, calls from Shonda. I was like, Shonda's calling me? Oh, my God, Shonda's calling me. She saw the date. Delete, like, delete, delete the tweet, delete. Like, because apparently there's crazy people that wanted to kill her because she had just killed off McDreamy and they knew where we were because I had just posted a picture of where we were. And so I had tweeted, like, oh, we're at this hotel. So there was, you know, they had to get security. So that was my experience with my boss, Shonda Rhimes, okay? So whoa, now, whoa, 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 whoa. People were there because she killed off McDreamy? No, people were there because I was there. But people were also there... Because she, because who she is in everything she's done, but they were also very angry people there because she had just, she didn't kill off McDreamy. The writers killed off McDreamy. Huh, I'm going to be killed off too after saying this. Um, no, but they were obviously very passionate about that character and it had just happened. And so I happened to very ignorantly, is that a word? Tweet that I was at the same place she was, which is supposedly, you know, a faux pas. So I had done that, um, and so, uh, yeah, that was my that was my great Shonda moment. That's scary. That's why I'm just like I just can't speak with her. I'm just like I prefer Hello. for her to yeah. Just hi. Don't forget my she's name very involved break. behind the scenes. Obviously, reads you know and helps Pete whenever he needs any help. But he's pretty he's pretty good on his own two feet. And now working with the Queen, Viola. <sighs> Yeah. Uh, That's my question. That was literally uh, just a question. (laughs) Was it a question? Working with the queen. Viola. How Mm. is it working with the queen? Yeah, as I was telling you backstage, um, I still have anxiety over my my scenes. The the next few episodes, I have a lot of scenes on my own with her. And um, I had nightmares about it. And um, uh, yeah, because we're normally, we're all in a group and... Um, everyone had had their fair share of scenes with her, especially Wes, and now it was my turn, and I just, you know, um, the character doesn't think, oh, this is my first time to come in in her, you know, office on on my own. Um, So I had to somehow translate that anxiety into something else. But um, she's lovely. She, uh, she's a human being that's just full of compassion and love and empathy towards everything, and she brings um, she brings joy to the set every day, and she's a great number one on the call sheet. And uh, she just had her vow renewal yesterday, the day before yesterday, and she uh, she had me read a Pablo Neruda poem in Spanish. I don't think anyone understood what I was saying, but um, she just got uh, renewed her vows in uh, L.A. and and we were all there, so we've become a family. And so now I just she's like my sister. That's incredibly sweet. Yeah, she's very sweet. So she asked you to read a uh, read that poem specifically, or did she ask you to choose a poem? No, she asked asked to me for me to read that one specifically. And then Billy Brown, who plays Nate, had the translation. He was in back of me translating it, which is just great. His voice, you know, he was just like, I was just like, yeah, keep talking. That's what I'm saying. I was like, that's what I'm saying. Um, and uh, yeah, she had. Um, we were just, I guess, like her flower girls. Now, a lot of people, you mentioned that you were working in Mexico City in, in, in films before doing this uh, show, but you were pretty successful in, in Mexico City as well. And still, I mean, you had this movie that uh, Instruction's Not Included, I think it's, it's, it's called, right? Which mm-hmm. was like one of the highest grossing Spanish language films in the United it's States. It's the highest grossing by far, yeah, in Spanish in the U.S. I think it's the first film that actually was able to capture Hispanic audiences in the U.S. That's right. There was a huge conversation afterwards that, like, okay, there is clearly, because people had been talking about a Hispanic audience that they weren't tapping into, and then no that one was the movie that was, like, that, yeah. 
we really are not tapping yeah. into this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I happened to be that year was a very special special year in Mexico because I was in the two highest grossing movies that suddenly broke all the records within a few months of each other. And so I happened to be, you know, I was blessed to be on both of those. And so that's what sort of got me interest here in LA um, to have a decent agent and decent manager, all that stuff that you pretty much need. Um, and so that was, uh, that was a great experience and it was both of them were comedies. So people in Latin America know me a lot more for, for my, uh, my comedies uh, and now I'm on a very serious drama. So it's good to, to be able to you know, come and, and do, do other type of... Are you gonna comedies. go out for some comedies in, in the States? Have yeah. you tried? Have you auditioned or anything? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if I say yes and I, and I didn't get it, how awful would that be, right? Yeah, I guess you're right. I Sorry. mean, no, but I'm going to do a romantic comedy in March and April. Um, I'm also co-producing it, and it's going to call uh, it's Everybody Loves Somebody. Oh, That's cool. the name of it. Um, and it's, it's you know, romantic comedy. So there's going to be comedy in it. Um, romantic comedy. But, but yeah, but yeah. romantic comedy. Um, and Are then, you a big romantic comedy fan? I think if it's done well, because um, I feel like sometimes they just brush over the montage part of when the people actually fall in love, and I feel that unless you do it, you play it as a drama, like a real life thing, then it doesn't really pay off. The payoff isn't there. Anyway. It's one of those things that it's really, uh, it's really hard, I find, to do to do right when it comes to movies because yeah. it, the romantic comedy genre is a setup where you know what the end is going to be from the beginning. Right. So you have to find a way to make that entire journey surprising, right. funny, and interesting. Right. So the audience can kind of forget that by the end that of the they movie, know they knew. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, you go on a Disneyland ride and you know exactly what you you know you're gonna see or what you're gonna do, and yet you still love going on it and over and over and over again. It's just like you wanna go through that journey. Um and I think each journey is very different and the same as you know, in how to get away, you know that you you know, there's gonna be I don't know, like a shocking moment or a death coming up or someone's going to be murdered, but it's the story of how you go through that and how you go through those steps and how that specific human being does that that makes it very interesting and compelling to watch. Valentine's Day was yesterday, so we're kind of a day off. What's your favorite romantic comedy? Um, oh, man, I don't know. Something like You've Got Mail or Sleepless in Seattle or something like that, yeah. Love You've Got Mail. It's so yeah, underrated. Yeah, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I would I would go for You've Got Mail over Sleepless. Sleepless? Yeah, to be honest with you. It's great, isn't I love it? love the way the Upper West Side looks on the, in that movie. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. I think we have some time for audience questions. Hi, okay. thank you so much for being here. Um, you mentioned that you had a seven-year contract with the show. And I wanted to know, like, how do you hope that your character will progress and grow? Uh, thank you. What a great question. Um, I really thought that was going to be a business question at first. <laughs> I know. I was like, uh, I just had, I just read a tweet from Shonda. She says she no longer have the seven-year contract and you're fired. I was like, I'm just curious. What stipulations? Yeah. Did you is put anyone in with else doing a show right now? Could can I get hired? Um, so uh, how do I? I really hope that um, because the show is very plot-driven, that uh, it's sort of um, also as character driven as it is plot driven and I feel like as long as they bring them back to the characters and why the characters uh, what their motivation is why they're there um, um, what their insecurities are what, what they want you know from each other that always makes it a lot more interesting as an actor to play so I really hope I have more um, more of that and they've been doing a lot of that this uh, season too so I'm really happy to um, explore explore the character part of the show. Uh, every show has every every show's supporting characters in many ways have sort of like their their own episode eventually per season I would right. say or maybe one or two episodes you know. Um, when it comes to your episode, when when that comes, do they ever come to you and talk to you and tell you that this is going to be your episode? This is the storyline we're thinking. What do you think about it? No, once again. You think they t they tell us things? They don't tell us anything. Um, no, but they do. We have these meetings with Pete, the director, 
the sorry the creator and the producing director Bill Delee and we have conversations about where we think our character is going what our input is um, and so there are those those conversations do happen and whether they pay attention to what you want or what you're saying that's completely besides the point but at least you're able to express what you feel and um, Laurel's grown a lot this season and I'm very um, grateful for that to have had a chance to you know um, have bigger scenes like that and um, and I feel like I've been able to sort of give them a different view of what, um, you know, they mention a lot Laurel's father, so I've had a few uh, pointers as to w what I think they at least shouldn't do. Um, and then there's a few plot points that are coming up that I uh, shared how I think I should, Laurel should react. And so they sometimes hear it and they're like, oh, I hadn't thought, we hadn't thought about that. So we do pitch, we do pitch things, but, you know, who knows if they will be taken. Next question. Hi, Carla. Hi. So I'm so happy that How to Get Away with Murder is back. My mom and I watch it religiously together. <laughs> Yay, thank oh my you. God, it's amazing. So my question is, when you first got the script and it wasn't revealed who shot Annalise, who did you initially think it was? Um, 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 do you mean the shot Annalise season two? Okay. Um, I thought... I don't, it's not because I am Laurel, but I really thought it was going to be me, uh, Laurel, because I had heard Pete say in an interview, see, he doesn't talk to me, I just read what he says in interviews, um, that he had, at the beginning of the season one, he thought Laurel was going to be the killer, but then it turned out to be Wes because of reasons of Rebecca and all that, which made sense. And then this time around, I was like, oh, it's probably going to be Laurel, um, because they'd kept her so mysterious throughout season one. Um, and then, uh, he again switched on it and decided she was going to take the blame for it. Um, but she wasn't going to actually do it because again, it made sense because of Rebecca and things. Um, but yeah, I kind of, uh, I kind of thought it would be Laurel, even though I, I hoped it wouldn't for some reason. Yeah. Next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, so with a show like this, sometimes you find out a character's like driving force or motivation kind of towards the end of the season. So as an actor, how do you play those really ambiguous moments where you don't really know what's driving Laurel? Yeah. Oof. Um, Are you just checking answers on your I'm hand? I'm like, yeah, what did I, what did Viola say when she was asked that? Um, no. Um, somehow the scene always has... It's also hard when the scene is just about, you know, exposition or information and they have us because we're a supporting cast saying a lot of those things and it's our job to make it very real and rooted in something that isn't just about plot points. Um, and I think, you know, people's motivation, you know, she's in law school, so it's just kind of very simple. She's in law school. She probably um, has hopes and dreams to be there, she probably has an idea of what the law is, and the law, she she was very idealistic, so she thought the law was there for the less fortunate, and she never um, had seen the law as dark as she was experiencing it with Annalise. So even if they don't tell me what my character's motivation is, I can sort of have, I have to have something in my head, and whether that then clocks with what they're writing, then, you know, I can't really have control over that, but I have to... Um, I have to have one, and sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not so right, but normally people just want to be loved, and then, you know, everything else falls into that. Like, want they want acceptance, they want validation, they want to prove their parents, they want to... So, um, so I, can always, I could always ground it in something like that. I will say, before we wrap this up as well, I've said the word supporting cast a couple times, and you just said supporting cast, but you guys are really, like... The right. I mean, it's it's Viola, but then but then you guys and you guys are on every episode and have storylines every episode. True. It's not necessarily like a supporting three episode arc or anything right. like that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, the show Thursday night at ten, and I think you're gonna have a, a pretty big part in this upcoming episode. Yes, and the one after that. And the Ooh, one after and that. And the one after that. And the one after that. Yeah. Every episode. I think they every suddenly episode. notice, like, oh, she can act. <laughs> Let's give her some more stuff. Uh, no, I'm really happy, and uh, obviously we love... I think New York has the the most uh, tweeting for the show. Like, when it's out in New York, we get the most tweeting, live tweeting done. 
Um, and so we're really excited because people, we know people love the show here. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. Uh, maybe I have no idea. I was gonna say because it's set in Philly and that's close by, but that's probably the you know not the reason. Um, I don't know if it's. I don't know. I don't know. Should I say I don't know again? Hey, I don't know. <laughs> It's a bunch of New Yorkers like, yeah, I'd shoot her too. I'd, 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 I'd manipulate that person yeah. to get what I want in that yeah. situation. Yeah. Carla, thank you so much for being here. Thank it's been you a pleasure guys talking for coming. to you. Thank you. Thanks.